recording now. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me um, uh, very well. Please use the chat window if, um, if you can't hear or if you want to uh, give some questions. We will answer the question as possible after the webinar, not in between. Um, the chat window can be reached if you go with the mouse to the top of the screen and click on, on the little chat icon there. Um, the webinar will be recorded and, well, it takes maybe some days, but then it will be uh, available through our Carbocom website and you can hear and see the whole content of the webinar. Um, this is for the end and I actually will now hand over to uh, Professor Schulze um, so he can start. And you move to presenter. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, I hope you can hear me. Well, I can do. Okay. So, now I will share my desktop and uh, you, yeah, you will immediately see, I hope, all of you what we are talking um, about today. And, uh, it's just a couple of uh, cases I will present to you with some ideas uh, what you can do or what you, what you can avoid uh, in implant diagnostics. And uh, it's just, uh, the, let's say, uh, quintessence of uh, some years of work. Um, I started in, uh, uh, let's say, 2000 with uh, CVCT. Uh, evaluation, so you can imagine that uh, I've seen a lot of cases uh, with regard to implant planning. And, um, so I, I think I make it uh, I made it very uh, simple for today. So what what we wanna what we're gonna talk about is uh, that we watch out some simple planning issues. Uh, like how we have to prepare something uh, before we make a CVCT for uh, implant planning. Next point would be uh, to, to respect some anatomic variations we can see in a patient uh, so that you have to uh, look for, let's say, some distinct landmarks which can be a problem or result into some problems when you uh, make the evaluation of the data set. We will check out some physiologic changes uh, which we can see in the bone which uh, are of some value for you. That means not only the, let's say, strict measurements but also changes after, let's say, extraction of teeth, uh, what you can see in CVCT data sets. Um, we will have a look on some pathologic patterns and some uh, problems uh, which can occur in the bone and finally, we check out for uh, two, um, yeah, let's say, mis uh, uh, misled cases uh, with regard one to implant placement and the second one to uh, a postoperative problem which occurred, which was very severe and um, I think which uh, dramatically underlines the need for a proper uh, imaging with regard to external sinus augmentation. Okay, let's start with some simple issues. Um, first of all, uh, we have to select uh, the proper patient. Mm. You, maybe you say, okay, everybody who uh, needs to get some implants uh, can be put into a CVCT device and I can acquire a volume. I can tell you that uh, not every patient is really suitable for CVCT uh, examination and um, we have to look for some uh, precautions uh, prior to the imaging. We have to check out for some removable prosthesis, for some jewelry and especially for hearing aids. Don't forget hearing aids uh, because they will cause some severe artifacts, especially in the upper jaw. So. Um, you can uh, avoid these kind of artifacts when you check out for some hearing aids. Just um, tell your uh, assistants that they check out for these uh, yeah, simple things uh, to, to avoid any kind of artifacts. 
Then, uh, as I said to you, there are some patients which are very, uh, let's say, difficult to acquire. Uh, patients with Parkinson's disease or uh, some tremors. Uh, so you have to look for proper fixation in your machine. And there are a lot of differences with regard to uh, headrests or head support. So maybe it is needed that you uh, put on some additional fixation to uh, stabilize the head position. And if it is possible, uh, with your machine, you have to check out for some short exposition time because um, the longer uh, the exposure needs, the more the, the more time the patient has to move. And um, we observed that um, in the past, when the machines uh, needed a long exposition time, um, we observed uh, more patient movement than uh, today, where we see uh, at least uh, exposition times below 10 seconds or even shorter. And please use, in every case you want to do some implant planning, use a scan guide or a scan splint. And even if you don't want to make uh, navigated implants or uh, computer-aided uh, implant positioning, just uh, check for some very, very easy uh, scan guides with some uh, cylindric reference objects or something like that. I will show you in a minute. <coughs> so, next point is uh, the selection of uh, some proper field of view or voice, uh, volume of interest, sorry, volume of interest. That means uh, what kind of volume do I need for my planning? Do I need only a small region, let's say of three to four teeth, or must it be even more than, let's say, about one jaw, upper or lower jaw? or both jaws if I want to uh, acquire upper and lower jaw for planning in all um, regions, or uh, shall I acquire the upper jaw with maxillary sinus? I told you this is, from my point of view, conditio uh, sine qua non when you want to uh, make, when you want to prepare something for an external sinus augmentation. And finally, um, you have to uh, look for some proper exposition and reconstruction parameters. Um, if it is possible, adjust the milliamperes uh, uh, with regard to the patient's constitution. That means uh, more lightweight people. <coughs> uh, you can uh, use smaller or lesser MA values and more thicker patients you need at least higher MA values if it is possible to change that. Um, in general, the KV value can be raised to the maximum value um, if it is possible to change that. So just check that uh, your machine works with the maximum KV values, which is available. Um, reconstruction should generate voxel sizes below or even to 200 um, microns. So uh, any kind of geometric um, problem can be avoided uh, with regard to the reconstructed exercise. So um, just <coughs> uh, secure that your exercise is not larger than 200 microns. Now we see the first case. And what you can see here is um, that we have some, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, metal balls in here. Uh, which are not really yeah, useful for uh, any kind of uh, reference because uh, metal balls are round and a round shape um, doesn't give you any uh, orientation in the data set where the, the plant implant axis could be. So we can check out the next image. It's just here the scout view of this, um, of this image. And we go to the next image. And I hope you can see my, my arrow. Is that possible? Can you tell me, uh, Mr. Bauer? Yeah, uh, can be seen. OK. Um, maybe I can enlarge it uh, later on. Uh, so what you see here is uh, uh, the transversal cross-section of the right uh, lower jaw. And once again, you see here this uh, metal ball. And there is no possibility to figure out any kind of direction of this uh, metal ball. So 
just avoid the use of any steel balls um, for uh, reference purposes. Uh, on the contrary, we see in the next uh, case that it was the other uh, side, and here we see uh, in addition some figure I will show you again in, in some minutes, this kind of lingual balcony, uh, which is typical in, uh, in a lot of patients in the side area, in the molar area. Uh, here again, you all know this problem that you can perform here, any perforation here, lingually. So just check out for these kind of balconies. Uh, this is a typical physiologic uh, problem in uh, lower jaws. Uh, but compare it, to, just remember these metal balls and compare it to this situation. Here we see um, a simple uh, reference splint um, for the left lower jaw. We see very small volume, just the part of the lower jaw was acquired. And you see that finally in the image I just cropped out uh, this area I need. I, I made uh, here this marking of the mandibular canal in this uh, on-demand 3D software, and finally uh, the cross-section reference images, these are the blue lines here, are going straight uh, through this cylindrical shape here, and in the next image we can see that um, here uh, you can really nicely uh, observe the, let's say, plant-implant axis where you can evaluate with this um, tube or cylinder is useful for further um, implant placement purposes or not. Okay, so you see a very easy difference between shears or metal bolts and these kind of uh, titanium cylinders or uh, what you ever want to use for <coughs> these kind of uh, uh, acquisitions. Okay, next point, anatomic variations. So. We've seen this uh, lingual balcony, and I can tell you that most of the anatomic variations occur in the mandible. Uh, in the maxilla, we can observe a lot of uh, atrophy. We will uh, check for this in the physiologic changes. Um, so lingual balcony is very common in mandible. Uh, even a lot of variations of the mandibular canal, you can observe uh, different, yeah, let's say, lumina of the mandibular canal, two or three different lumina, um, a splitting of the mandibular canal can be observed. But these conditions are very rare, so uh, normally, or in general, you will see only one uh, lumen of the mandibular canal. And uh, also a very rare condition is uh, the so-called hourglass shape in the premolar region uh, in the mandible as well. Uh, when you make a cross-section of the uh, premolar region, you can observe that the bone gets some kind of hourglass shape. That means uh, in the mid of the bone, uh, the shape is very, very thin, and only the cranial and uh, uh, basal parts of the bone are uh, thicker. And this uh, will lead to, yeah, let's say, uh, figure like a cystic shape in a panoramic uh, image, maybe you've seen that um, uh, as well in some uh, images, but this is a very rare condition. So just uh, look for changes in the mandible. And once again, I show you this balcony here in a different uh, patient. Here we have some uh, yeah, planning image uh, for the left mandibular part. And you see here in this uh, image, as you can see that in the, the molar region, again, we have some kind of balcony. Just check out uh, for this balcony. So just one simple, um, let's say, uh, change of the um, yeah, bone pattern in the lower jaw. OK, other side as well, here you can see. Very nice. Okay, typical change. Maybe, you know, uh, just avoid any kind of uh, planning there. Physiologic changes. <coughs> Physiologic changes uh, can be seen due to atrophy. You know, in elder patients, uh, we can see a lot of, we can, see, we can observe a lot of atrophy 
uh, with regard to the alveolar process. So uh, that only uh, the walls to the, let's say, maxillary sinus are left, or even the um, mandibular foramen or mental foramen is uh, on the upper side of the lower jaw. So there can be seen a lot of atrophy, even vert uh, either vertical or horizontal or both altogether. So uh, <coughs> just check out for atrophy and their consequences for your uh, plans to implant. Um, after extraction of teeth, you can uh, check out for the consolidation of the alveoles. You all know that uh, the bone needs some time to consolidate, and that, let's say after uh, four weeks, uh, let's say to six weeks, we you see first results of consolidation, and uh, that's what we uh, right now will look at in the next few minutes. So please remember that if a consolidation is retarded or, or prolonged, if there is no real consolidation in an alveol or a root socket, um, you have to think of any kind of metabolic problems or other uh, issues, maybe an inflammation which is um, leading to some kind of retardation of this consolidation. So uh, please check for uh, extraction uh, socket, so uh, if there is a real new bone pattern. So, this is just the example for atrophy. We have here upper jaw situation, and this is the what we call it the uh, canine uh, complex. So, in most of the patients, uh, even in patients with a lot of atrophy, uh, at least will find some bone in this area where you can take some measurements uh, for, for implant planning. And uh, what we see here is a typical shape here in the side area, distal area of the uh, upper right jaw, um, a typical horizontal and vertical atrophy. And uh, finally, here in this canine region, a typical horizontal atrophy, very thin, um, alveolar process here, and uh, this uh, also um, yeah, pro is propagated here to the incisal region, and here we are on the other side, on the left hand side of the upper jaw, and once again, very thin um, alveolar process, thin alveolar process in the canine region, and finally, again, uh, the typical atrophy uh, in the side area. Uh, next patient is um, the situation after extraction, and I hope that um, these images are clear for you. I just check if they are in the right uh, order. Okay, here we see a situation some weeks after extraction, and you can see uh, exactly that uh, uh, the second premolar which was extracted, and you can see uh, a very thin, light gray, light grayish line of new bone here. Here again, you can see that uh, in the innermost part of the root socket, there's, uh, yeah, we have to think about if there's no bone, but uh, it might be. And um, so finally, um, maybe the situation is uh, affordable for uh, putting in an implant, but uh, four months later, this situation looks like that. So you see a complete reorganization of this pattern. You can just even imagine that there was some kind of extraction, but there is complete consolidation, very good uh, situation for uh, implant insertion. So just remember that uh, you always can take your time, you can wait for the healing of the bone, for reconsolidation of this uh, bony area, and uh, for, let's say, improvement in the uh, structural pattern. Pathologic patterns, which we can observe, are, uh, you all know, root rests, which you have to avoid for putting in implants there, could be very deteriorating, we have a lot of cementoosseous changes. I will show you some case of cementoosseous dysplasia 
um, where you don't know what kind of let's say biomechanical uh, characteristics the bone has, so um, just check out for uh, these cementers or cementer osseous changes because they are very common in lower jaw. Um, you can see even cementoma, which is a subgroup of cementer osseous uh, changes. Um, you can see uh, reactive sclerotic changes, which are normally a reaction on inflammatic changes in the bone. And here we are with our root rest. And you can exactly see some kind of root filling material here inside. And, uh, that's why it's really important, especially when you don't know the patient, you make a panoramic radiograph, it is possible that you oversee a small root rest because panoramic radiographs only depict uh, such a layer of the bone and it could be that small root rests are overseen in panoramic radiograph. So to evaluate uh, the, the bone volume, especially uh, with regard to these kind of changes, um, it's much better to uh, acquire a combium CT. We all know root rests. <coughs> Other bone changes you can see here, I made a series of uh, kind of sagittal uh, images just for yeah, they give you some alternate <laughs> views to these typical um, to these typical transactions. And what you see here is uh, are not root rests. These are uh, socket uh, preservations, and you see that they can look very similar to root rests. So uh, if you don't know exactly if there are any socket preservations, just ask the patient or just figure out if you can. Uh, uh, figure this information out from the uh, colleague who has uh, done it before. So it might be really critical to differentiate between uh, socket preservation and root rests. And here, once again, you see here this kind of material which was brought in here as well and uh, here as well. So this is all material, this is no root rest, and uh, you can see it could be <laughs> very critical to uh, figure out uh, if it is a bone, if it is a root rest or not. This is a, a patient with uh, fluorid uh, cementosis dysplasia, and what you see here is a large change here in the uh, right lower jaw, uh, just respecting the outer layer of the bone, a large change with uh, some kind of hypodense material which is propagating here in the bone, expanding the bone a little bit, you can see especially here very well, some kind of expansion. And uh, in a later on stage of this uh, um, pathologic change, all this kind of hypodense material, which is uh, hypodense due to the fibroblasts which are inside here, uh, is uh, remodeled into cement or sales, uh, material or cement uh, material, which you can see here around um, this premolar. Uh, but here around you can see uh, anyway the uh, fibroblastic change. So uh, all these teeth are vital. There's no change in the teeth, there's no problem, no, no pain. The patient has no pathologic sensation. But you can imagine that uh, these kind of uh, changes in the bone are not really predictable with regard to their uh, biomechanic characteristics. Here, the next uh, two here, you see a different stage with regard or in comparison to these two. So uh, just remember that there are a lot of cemento osseous changes, especially in the lower jaw. And another case here, uh, let's say cementoma, and once again, the typical question which is asked uh, with regard to the preparation prior to an implantation is, can I insert an implant there or not? I can only tell you that I wouldn't recommend this region for implant insertion because you don't know what you will expect here. Um, somebody is saying to me that uh, it would be nicer to just put all the material out and put some, uh, um, yeah, let's say, bone augmentation material there or uh, bone uh, reposition material. So 
uh, you can imagine if this will run or not. Um, I don't know. I only can tell you this is a, a situation where I would recommend uh, to put an implant in there. And another one, a smaller lesion, which could also be a displaced, uh, could also be displaced compact bone, or in a similar shape, could also be a bone scar. There are a lot of uh, lesions like that. So just uh, check out how large they are, and um, if you uh, can avoid to put the implants inside of these kind of lesions. And here, once again, very small changes. Um, could be reactive sclerosis as well. Could be uh, dislocated compact bone. From the radiological pattern, we don't know. So uh, we only can say, uh, yeah, we have to figure out if you really want to put some implants in there. And here we have uh, a pattern which I want to uh, show you. I wanted to show you that you can see that in detail. Um, this is a patient with some uh, fractured roots here and some really large uh, theory apical uh, inflammation here. And what you can see here is a reactive bone change here. And um, it, for remembering that, I will show you uh, immediately the other side of the lower jaw. So, to, so just compare this side with the normal side. Okay, so this is the normal side of the lower jaw, um, the right hand side, and once again the changed left hand side. And you see that um, we see a lot of reactive bone changes. All this hyper dense structures here is reactive bone change. Uh, you see that the mandibular canal is. Um, yeah, let's say uh, stressed by the bony changes. You see, see uh, you see it much darker than before because the contrast between this dense area and the dark canal structure is uh, much higher uh, than in comparison with the other side. Once again, here we have at least here we have normal cancellous bone. Or here, normal cancellous bone, no sclerosis. And uh, once again, here a lot of sclerosis. So even there, you have to know that sclerotic bone changes are not a big problem. Sclerotic bone changes are only a sign of at least the impact of more uh, minerals into the bony pattern uh, as a reaction on, let's say, this inflammation. Okay. So reactive sclerosis, very typical in case of any kind of periapical or periodontal bone changes. You can see as well here periodontal bone change and a very small uh, reactive bone pattern. And finally, <coughs> we look out for some, yeah, let's say problems um, due to implant placement and uh, some post-operative problems uh, prior to implant placement and both of the cases are at least uh, severe ones so uh, um, we check out for the penetration of the mandibular canal. You all can imagine that um, there hasn't been or there mustn't be kind of a situation like that. The implants uh, can penetrate the mandibular canal uh, but they don't have to, and the patient can have kind of dysesthesia uh, uh, or yeah, change of uh, sensation uh, because um, if the implant is, let's say, screwed um, onto the roof of a mandibular canal, um, there could be a, at least an edema in the tissue of the mandibular canal which raises the pressure on the uh, swan cells of the uh, alveolar nerve, which leads to at least uh, problems with the sensation. And that means uh, implants uh, don't have to penetrate the manipular canal. It can always cause uh, problems in the patient. Um, 
more or less you can lose ornamentation material and um, this is uh, very critical with regard to external sinus lift and uh, external sinus uh, floor augmentation and we will look at one of the case and that's why I tell you please uh, take care of any kind uh, and any sign of acute sinusitis before uh, yeah, going into action in uh, terms of making any sinus floor augmentation. Okay, here we are with the both implants on the lower right mandible and what you can see is a very uh, typical um, situation when the implants are penetrated through the mandibular canal. The patient told me that um, once the uh, implants were inserted, she never felt anything <laughs> on this side, so, which is really clear when you see that, that uh, the complete lumen of the mandibular canal is obstructed um, by, the, uh, by both implants and that means that all the um, uh, neural sensations are blocked here and there's no further um, yeah, information uh, delivered to the brain. So uh, very clear, uh, you all know these kind of figures. Um, let's say a more severe case is this one and uh, I remember that uh, she came um, last year just some hours prior to the planned uh, implantation and uh, some weeks before the colleague uh, put some augmentation material in the sinus floor and what you can see here um, in the sagittal view of the right maxillary sinus is um, let's say some kind of heterogeneous um, yeah, structures of this uh, augmentation material. You see some reaction here in the right maxillary sinus, but then we will check out now for the right maxillary sinus and you see here that uh, there are particles of this augmentation material distributed through the whole sinus. The sinus is at least almost completely filled with you know, fluid. I don't know exactly, but uh, the patient told me that uh, it was very thick fluid and uh, she had a longer, longer history on maxillary sinusitis. So uh, due to this acute sinusitis, the whole augmentation material was lost and uh, even some portions are here in the front and another portion of the augmentation material is here near the physiological uh, ostium of the maxillary sinus so that even the normally uh, drainage way uh, of the maxillary sinus was blocked or obstructed so uh, that the process uh, got more severe and severe and uh, finally uh, the whole uh, yeah, implant planning was uh, uh, thrown away so uh, she um, I met her uh, some weeks ago, so uh, the situation in the maxillary sinus here is not, not much better now and uh, I only can tell you that please take care of patients with uh, acute maxillary sinusitis or even uh, severe chronic uh, maxillary sinusitis before you enter the maxillary sinus for augmentation. So let's sum up all these information. <coughs> What you can do, or what you have to do is acquire appropriate volumes with adapted exposition parameters. Think about the volume you need for your patients and think about the exposition parameters due to the constitution um, if the machine allows you any kind of change. Use splints or guides with some reference objects. Yeah, just think about the implant axis which can be seen in uh, cylindrical uh, shapes but uh, which are impossible to see in metal balls. Yeah? Uh, so please use uh, simple guides out of some plastics which are very easy to uh, fabricate um, for uh, your CBCT acquisition. If there is any planned external sinus lift, I just repeated it uh, three or four times, please acquire the upper jaw and the complete maxillary sinus uh, with the 
physiological foramen of the sinus so that you can control uh, the complete volume and are very, that you are very sure uh, what you will deal with uh, in the future in your plant um, operation. If you plan uh, implants in the lower jaw, visualize the canal uh, and perform some measurements, it's really clear. Uh, you have to do it as well in the upper jaw and make some proper reports. Make scout views like you've seen before and in addition some separate transactions and save these images. So you don't need to open the whole data set when you talk again with your patients. Just make some scout views so that you know, okay, the data is from, let's say, the upper right jaw or lower left jaw and in addition save some separate transactions so that you can see um, your measurements in full screen view. What you don't do or what you have to avoid is the use of inappropriate data sets for measurements, especially when the patient moved while the acquisition was made. So just check uh, for uh, patient movement in data sets. You can easily uh, observe that in the frontal teeth area or if you see some uh, double contours of the bone. Um, so please check out for these uh, kind of patient movements. Um, avoid any kind of severe metal artifacts which is striking through the bone. It could, um, uh, it could, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, cover any kind of uh, pathologic changes. Um, so um, please wonder how to position the patient in the machine. It, uh, all the metal, effects, metal artifacts due to crowns or any other restorations will travel uh, in the occlusal area. Um, don't perform oblique measurements. That means, especially in the transactions, look that the transaction is parallel to your implant axis. If you uh, do not, if you don't rotate the volume for exact position, you will perform so-called oblique measurements, which will be in most of the cases too long, so that you overestimate your uh, proper bone volume. Uh, do not underestimate the pathologic bone changes I, I, I showed you, uh, cement osseous changes or even incomplete osseous consolidations because these can be signs of some metabolic problems, these can be signs of impro improper bone uh, biomechanic uh, characteristics, so uh, just check out for um, these osseous consolidations. And Finally, and when we are talking about CCT, I have to do this at least one time. Do not overestimate uh, the information on your 2D imaging or your clinical impression when you compare it with your CBCT results. So please be aware that uh, any kind of information you generate out of a panoramic image is uh, at least more or less not the same um, in value when you compare to your combing CT data set. I have to thank you for your attention and uh, finally I only show this, uh, um, yeah, this kind of uh, information to you that we uh, do a lot of uh, individual teaching, group teaching, uh, we are available for reading services and second opinion and I hope that uh, one day we can help you as well. So thank you once again and uh, see you next time here in the webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schulze. Um, and we will probably stay in, um, in the call because I have uh, two questions coming up from the audience. Um, I can read them because I don't understand them. <laughs> I'm not a dentist. So on cases of lack of mandibular bone in height and volume, would you consider a creatal augmentation? If so, with what material? Um, in case of uh, lack of uh, bone, uh, I would um, consider the, uh, let's say, a mix of, uh, uh, yeah, 
uh, augmentation material, which can be uh, like bio or or something like that. So uh, not human, uh, even industrial, um, even industrial preparation, and uh, and a mix with. Uh, uh, own bone, that means autologous bone from the patient. That would be my recommendation. From the last 10 years, what I've seen is that uh, in most of the cases, a mix of the patient's own bone and additional augmentation material uh, out, of the, out of the box uh, is, from my point of view, the best solution. Okay. Um, and the second question was, um, on the case of sclerotic bone, would you recommend in favor or against the implant placement? Oh, uh, in case of sclerotic bone, um, I think this is not a big problem because sclerotic changes are only, let's say, a reaction on uh, inflammation. If the uh, origin of the inflammation is, uh, is gone, let's say, due to an extraction, and further excoffiation of um, the area, um, there is at least no danger um, that uh, the biomechanic properties of the bone are really changed. This is just, a, let's say, uh, the flooding of mineral uh, salts into this area to uh, make a barrier against the inflammation. If the origin of inflammation is gone, there is uh, no from my point of view, uh, there I see no problem to put an implant in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I think the last question for today um, is, uh, wouldn't it affect the vascular properties and therefore healing of the site? I think it's referring also to the sclerotic bone. Mm, I just can you remember, I can't read the, the question. Where ah, wait a second, I, can, I, I post it here to... Um, to, oh. uh, wouldn't it affect, ah, I see, I go to the chat window. Uh, wouldn't it affect, uh, wouldn't it affect the vascular properties and therefore healing of the side? Um, I don't, I don't understand the question right uh, correctly. I think uh, what would affect the vascular properties and therefore the healing? Uh, maybe the, uh, maybe the, the sclerotic changes. Um, yeah, that, well, that's a, that's a nice question. Uh, but um, as far as I can say, that uh, when you check out um, bone changes in uh, MRI, you can see. Um, a lot of vascular changes. You can see edema, you can see uh, uh, change of the normal narrow pattern and so So uh, if, if you could see uh, any kind of these uh, bone changes in MRI, I think a lot of people would avoid placing implants inside the bone because they didn't know what will happen there. And uh, from my point of view, that uh, if uh, sclerosis is a normal reaction of the, of the bone, uh, with regard to inflammation, and the origin of the inflammation is gone. Um, I don't see, uh, in, in, in case of typical, let's say, sclerotic changes due to, let's say, periapical uh, changes, I don't see any uh, obstacle to for, for an implant insertion. So uh, I don't think that uh, this can be uh, compared to a typical osteomyelitis or something like that. So uh, only small changes can be uh, there. There would be no obstacle for, for implant insertion. And there's another question I see. I think one left, yeah, exactly. How we, how we can do the difference uh, between the artifact or the translucency of the implant failure or... So it's always a, a critical thing in 3D tomography, right? What, what do you mean with the um, difference between artifact translucency? Uh, yeah, uh, do you mean that the, the, the metal artifact is... Uh, um, I, I understand. Um, you, you, I think um, what is meant is the, 
artifact around an implant. Yes. Uh, right now, uh, we can say that uh, the CBCT machines, um, yeah, uh, let's say, become more and more uh, better uh, with regard to the depiction of, let's say, one single implant. So today, it is possible to view all the bone around the implant. So uh, these kind of artifacts can be avoided in the future. The problem will occur again when at least two implants are side by side and put inside together. So um, it could be that there uh, is again uh, again artifacts and. To overcome this situation, I only can recommend to make some intraoral radiographs to uh, control that. But uh, this, as, as long as we observe these kind of artifacts, there will be no solution um, for this question. Yeah. Well, that means with one implant, I can look around, OK. But uh, if there are uh, two or more implants, uh, side by side, there will be, uh, in in all cases, there will be kind of signal loss, and that means there is a metal artifact. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much also for the uh, to the participants to that uh, questions and and answers here. Um, so I th uh, started at the beginning that we have recorded this uh, webinar, so it will be available soon on the web pages. And uh, you will also, all audience will get uh, a link automatically by email. And if there are any questions regarding the software that uh, Professor Schulze used um, for the uh, implant planning and to show this, the on-demand software, uh, I'll be happy to, um, to answer your questions on that. So my email address is tobias.bauer at carbo.com. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions to Professor Schulze himself, you can also pass them through me. So I will thank you um, for this webinar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schulze, and uh, yeah, have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.